Thank you all for coming to our, um, our office at WeWork. We really appreciate having you here. Um, this was kind of a self-organized event from a bunch of legal tech companies that um, said, you know, we need to do something cool for law firms and in-house legal departments to see what we're up to because, um, you know, they don't like, you know, hanging out with us in their free time. It's a little bit hard to get on their agenda because they're so busy during the day. So we thought we'd have a fun event in the evening um, to show you the technologies, to give you a little bit more about our company and to um, to kind of ask questions and, and make it easy and fun. Um, so we are showcasing four very cool technologies, so you'll, you'll see them. Um, and the four companies here today are starting to make really good progress, slow but steady progress in the legal space um, in both improving process and product of the legal community. So if you're not working with one of us now, um, your competitors are, or they will be soon, so keep an eye out. And then we want to thank our wonderful sponsors, Davis Wright Tremaine and Code Resnick. And then we want to thank our startup friends um, at Swill, who were out there before, for, um, for delivering the alcohol to us today. Um, that's always a good part of it. So without further ado, Ned and Ibrevia. Thank you. So I'm Ned Ginn. I'm CEO of Ibrevia. And we're commercializing cutting-edge artificial intelligence technology developed at Columbia University to analyze and extract information from legal documents. Uh, we were one of four national winners in the Startup America demo competition. And CIO.com then designated the company as having one of the top <coughs> 10 enterprise products at the demo conference in Santa Clara. Uh, we also received the Connecticut Technology Council's Most Promising Software Product of the Year Award. Now, when I was practicing law as a junior associate, I spent many nights reviewing and summarizing contracts as part of the due diligence process and mergers and acquisitions. I'd generally be working with a large team of other junior associates, going into virtual data rooms, looking through all the target companies, um, customer contracts, employment agreements, leases, etc., and extracting key provisions and summarizing them. So the work product that we would typically produce as uh, junior attorneys, sometimes it was used um, internally, sometimes it was, it was actually sent to the client, looked something like this for each document. Um, you'd have the name of the agreement, the different types of provisions you were looking for, and then a brief uh, summary of the provisions in the corresponding cells on the right. So Ibrevia's diligence accelerator <coughs> isn't meant to replace these junior attorneys, but really to act as a tool to help them work through the process more accurately and efficiently. So I'll show you how it works. Um, you can see over here on the left-hand side of the screen a series of file folders. These are similar to what you might find in a virtual data room. Um, as many of you know, virtual data rooms are becoming increasingly commoditized products these days. So I'll first just demonstrate a few of the mechanics. Uh, really nothing, nothing special here. But it's uh, easy to create uh, a new folder. Um, uploading documents to this system is very easy. Uh, in this case, we'll just do some uh, dragging and dropping of the documents, but we can also hmm, we can also automate this process. Um, it's a, live demos are always interesting, so you have to, <laughs> you have to bear with me. I, I have backup PowerPoint slides, but I, I hope we don't have to use them. Um, so these documents are all just publicly available documents we've downloaded from the SEC website. Uh, once you're in the system, you can move them uh, to different document folders. I'm going to delete these since we're not going to be using them. But where Ebrevia really adds its value is in the actual analysis of the documents. So I'm going to select uh, a confidentiality agreement here. And then we can select a variety of different provisions that folks might be interested in um, in an M&A perspective. Um, let's see here. Get non-solicitation. Um, okay. Maybe jurisdiction, too. Now, one thing I'll point out is that um, this document in particular, this confidentiality agreement, is something we just printed off of the SEC website. Uh, we then scanned it in using one of those all-in-one kind of home scanners. Um, so it's an image file, and we have OCR software incorporated into the system, which converts it to text, and that's what allows our artificial intelligence uh, technology to analyze a document. I'll also just point out, if you want to see the source document, you can click on this little down arrow, and that's just a, a quick display of it. Oops, looks like I lost my check marks. So just grab a few of these again. 
Oops. Okay. You can just title the uh, the diligence report. Here I'm just running one uh, document through the system, but obviously the software adds a lot of value when you're you're putting through many documents at one time. So that's that's it. The document's been reviewed. Uh, we can click on that, and that brings us to this analysis screen. Now, what we have over here on the left-hand side is the source document itself, uh, similar to what I showed you before. And over here on the right is really the first step in generating that summary template. So it's extracted um, the information that, that we've designated. Now, if you click on this eyeball icon, it brings up the uh, change of control information within the source document. So it's easy for the attorney to toggle back and, and see it within context. If you think about a, a concept like change of control in an M&A setting, that could be included in, in terms of language like change of control. It could use uh, language like assignment by operation of law, merger. Um, but in a merger agreement, you'll have that word merger 100 times where really only one is applicable to this concept. So that's where the artificial intelligence comes in, is getting at the information that's relevant and leaving all the extra information behind. Now, if we scroll down a little bit, you'll see in this choice of law provision, um, it looks like the OCR software didn't quite get the word law correctly in applicable law. And that's interesting because if you were doing a simple keyword search, it's, it's possible that you'd miss a provision like this. Uh, but again, with the artificial intelligence technology, it's robust enough to, to still pull it out. So the attorney can clean that up pretty quickly, clicking on this little pencil icon. Um, you can do free text editing. Maybe the attorney wants to just strip out the legalese and uh, and just note that it's uh, New York law for whatever reason. Um, at the same time, if there's additional information that folks might want to add, so this is obviously severability information, but if they wanted to put it into one of the existing categories, you can just highlight it, right click it, and it'll populate the template. Um, at the same time, maybe the attorney decides that uh, they're not interested in, in equitable relief, they can click on this trash can icon and delete it. So when the attorney is satisfied uh, with the review of the document, they click Review Complete, change the status, save it. And the other, the, actually the other thing I'll mention is that in addition to what I'll show you here today, and this is one of the more exciting features we're incorporating, is we're going to be having the artificial intelligence technology continue to learn as attorneys work with it. So it can tailor itself to individual attorneys or practice groups over time. And I'd be happy to chat with folks um, offline about that as well. So once the document has been processed, the summary can be accessed again through this summary folder, and that includes all the same changes, save changes, or it can also be um, exported to Word. So this will look very similar to what I showed you before uh, that had been manually generated. So very quickly, I'll just um, show you one other piece. Um, as I said, you know, we've, we've looked primarily at uh, just one document where the software adds a lot of value if you're analyzing multiple documents at the same time. Let me just select a few different provisions here. And the nice thing about running this in the cloud is we're able to um, ramp up the number of servers as needed so we can manage the processing time. But here you'll see in this chart view, it basically shows you which uh, provisions have been found within the different documents. You can click on this link. It will provide you with the information in the, uh, the summary template. And then again, you can view it within the context of the source document if you desire. Um, so that's a, a little bit about the software. Um, you know, a lot of our users are excited about it for a number of reasons. Uh, some people see it as really accelerating the time to get a deal done. Other people are more excited about the accuracy um, implications. So if you think about that first or second year associate going through uh, a, you know, folders and folders of documents at 3 in the morning with a deadline the next day, it's easy for things to fall through the cracks. And this uh, type of software can help prevent that. Other folks in firms have, have really been very candid with us about some of the pushback they're getting, uh, particularly with regard to junior level work. And um, this type of software can help them to write off less of that junior level time or if they're working under a flat fee arrangement to actually take advantage of some of the cost savings. And then finally, uh, we've had folks that have really been excited about it from a marketing perspective in that they can go to their clients or potential clients and say, we're using technology like this so we can get the deal done faster, more quickly, and more accurately for you. Um, 
So in addition to our diligence project uh, product, we also have a product um, for in-house applications in terms of contract management. Um, so thanks very much for coming today. I really enjoyed showing you the software and happy to answer any questions people have. Yeah, can, um, on the select provisions, can you add, if, if you're looking for something particular, you're in a particular industry like healthcare, and there's some <coughs> issue about Medicaid reimbursement, can you add a search feature? Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. So we are actually dealing with a, a very industry-specific user, um, and we're training the software on <coughs> probably another 30 or 40 provisions kind of specific to that industry. Um, so that's something we can do internally at this time. And we're also contemplating that we'll be able to open that up to um, clients as well. Yeah. How fast is it? Because that was a very fast uh, synopsis. If you have a thousand pages, how fast will it go? Yeah, I mean, right now we've, we've switched to um, some larger servers, so it's going very, very fast. When we were on the uh, older ones, it was still processing 50 documents in under a minute. So it's, uh, yeah, it's very rapid, especially when you're comparing it to the alternative. <laughs> yeah, yes? How do you teach the tool what you mean by asset transfer, for example? It's something other than just searching for asset within so many words of transfer. Yeah, yeah, so that's interesting. That's where um, the artificial intelligence comes in, and it's a machine learning software. So we actually train it by examples. Um, we've had thousands of, um, well, We've had contract attorneys annotate thousands of documents we've downloaded from the SEC website. And these are folks with 10 to 20 years of experience. So they understand legal documents. It's like anything else. The quality of what you put through is, is the quality of what you get out on the other end. Um, but basically, the software sees all of this analysis. It, and then it, through analyzing that, it can understand when it sees a unique document, what's relevant and what's not. Um, Jake, who's our CTO, will, will be in the happy hour. He can get in, go into more detail. but it's. Uh, takes into account uh, word classes, synonyms, stemming, structural document features like paragraphs, section heads, and combines all that information to determine what to extract. Okay, and that comes essentially preloaded with the tool. That's right, all of these provisions are preloaded, mm -hmm. exactly. Great. And do you oh, guys know yes. what your um, like error rate is? Like how do you figure that out? Yeah, so it, it varies by provision. Um, we're actually doing some more internal testing now. But uh, what we've definitely found is both internally and within our users um, that people using the software are much less prone to make errors than people without the software. So, and that's really the analysis that we're looking at. It's, it's not so much man versus machine, but kind of person with the software against person without. And you know, I'll even say for my own purposes, it's been a little bit scary at times in that I've gone through documents and uh, thought, I, thought I had captured everything. And there's been times the software has picked things out that I've missed. So it's a little disconcerting. And, and the other exciting thing is you can actually, I, I don't know if that speaks more to my abilities as an attorney or <laughs> in software. I prefer, prefer to think the latter, but um, the other thing that's pretty exciting about it is we can actually see it getting smarter over time as we continue to train it and it sees more examples. Um, so I've been in demos where, you know, sometimes it'll make um, a judgment call that I might have decided the other way. And then a couple weeks later, the software will have learned, you know, based on that and, and no, that, that example will no longer be there. So it's, uh, that piece is fun. Thanks again. Thank you, Ned. Sure. Oh, and I'm sorry, I <laughs> forgot to introduce Mary from Travel. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Just more concerned about the technology. So um, my name is Mary Jetton. I'm the founder and CEO of Tracklight. I'm here from Phoenix, Arizona. I win a small prize, uh, maybe a drink later, for uh, coming the furthest. Um, I started Tracklight because I saw a need. I'm a recovering accountant, and I have about 25 years in business and finance experience. And I went back to law school and saw that there was this gap between what small businesses and entrepreneurs knew about intellectual property or in some cases decided to ignore about intellectual property and then what attorneys know about intellectual property once you get to them so what we built is a bridge or a software platform that allows entrepreneurs to answer questions in a self-guided questionnaire so it creates this custom IP strategy that gives them the education and information to be able to then go to the attorneys and so we are 
lead generation for attorneys, education for entrepreneurs, and along the way, we're actually saving some of the attorney time that they don't want to give away as free billable hours or spend interrogating or questioning somebody at the beginning of an engagement. So as an entrepreneur, I feel qualified to say that is what um, your life looks like when you're getting started. And we found through dealing with hundreds of entrepreneurs over the last, we've been a company now for three years and we've had software launched for just over two, that it doesn't stop with the getting started. If somebody makes it past the first couple of years without an IP strategy and without any bumps in a road, as they start growing, they'll find that they have problems that they could have prevented at the very beginning. So we created a um, questionnaire, it's called ID Your IP, which is, stands for Identify Your IP, but what it really is, is a self IP audit. But for those of you in marketing, you would never ask somebody to self audit themselves, that wouldn't go over very well. So as Ned mentioned, um, there is a lot of store. There are a lot of storage products out there. We have something which is a time-stamped, um, ver verifiable pro uh, storage product that allows safe sharing. Because with the proliferation of bring your own device with startups, you get into a lot of issues of people using Dropbox, which is not as secure. So we created something that comes along with our product or stands alone. So as attorneys in the room, you might be thinking, are we trying to replace attorneys? And the answer is absolutely not. Um, nothing we do is legal advice. Disclaimer, law degree, not a practicing attorney. <laughs> I'm not your attorney. I'm no one's attorney. That whole, uh, we take it very seriously, not to minimize it. But what we're trying to do is provide people with a business strategy, the choices, give them information on what they need to bring to the attorney to make your first meeting more productive. Um, so this is a little short clip. Got two track light words here from some potential clients. One is just not ready. She doesn't have anything, not even so much as a business entity. Uh, let's head over to Jack in Emerging Ventures. Okay, what about the other one? He has about four inventions, the same number of trademarks. He's also thinking of fundraising, so he needs to make sure he's got everything together. His IP is in pretty good shape though, so he needs some assignments. Okay, I'll give him 33 minutes and tell him to bring along his Tracklight reports. Don't be without Tracklight software to help you save time and money. Tracklight creates more business for attorneys. Pre-qualify your leads, your time is valuable. Don't get trapped giving away your billable hours to unqualified leads. <laughs> Contact Tracklight today. So that little skit, the longer version of that is on our website. We have a um, tab for law firms. So uh, just let me get this to skip it. So we have a tab for law firms. What we really want to do for firms is create a program where this is going to not replace your time, but it's going to help, especially in larger law firms, associates as they start having business development responsibilities. They don't know necessarily the right questions to ask in some of these interview initial interviews, so they can use the software tool themselves, or they can um, you know send it to the clients. So I'm going to give you this is a brief demo. Um, there's a lot of moving parts. So the first thing is our site is free to join, and we provide a lot of resources. So this is the dashboard that appears, um, and this is just showing you how to purchase. We create custom branded landing pages for law firms so that they don't, people don't get lost. They get directed right here into our application so you don't get lost on our website. And we have iframes available. The questionnaire, given my accounting background, is kind of modeled after the idea of TurboTax. You don't have to know anything about intellectual property in order to answer these questions. It's like, who are you? And as lawyers, you understand why some of these questions are being asked. Um, but the person filling it out doesn't necessarily have to know that. And the first three sections are basically who you are and that find, you know, discovers whether you have an entity, do you have contracts for your employees or, and your contractors, which is something that we hear back from attorneys. A lot of times people phone up and they say, I need a patent, but they actually don't have all the beginning pieces filled in. So the only place that we talk about intellectual property in all of this is under the existing IP tab. So if you don't have it, you can just skip right over it. And this um, whole questionnaire captures your IP or your potential IP based on 
the way an entrepreneur thinks, which is along these lines that you see underneath the top navigation bar, we specifically broke out brand because so many people, I like to say if I had a dollar for every person who told me they didn't have any IP and they actually have brand IP, uh, it would be like a separate revenue stream for us. So I'm gonna show you briefly what these reports are and if you wanna give me your card afterwards, I'm happy to send you our demo reports and a code to use the system. This is the one that is entrepreneur facing, it's for entrepreneur Eric, which is one of our marketing personas. And so the report comes out, it's got a lot of information, it's organized on the same way that you answered all the questions. So it's supposed to be a strategy, it's supposed to be something that's not too intimidating. This is the inventory and the IP snapshot. This is what is provided to attorneys. You can quickly go through this and see, does this person, is this person ready for my practice? If you're in emerging ventures, you can quickly see whether they have an entity, do they have employees without agreements? And then if you're an IP attorney, you can see what their existing registered IP is. And then you can also see, oh look, they have all this brand IP, but they don't have any trademarks and they don't have any copyrights. So it informs your first meeting with the client and allows you to turn away clients who might not necessarily fit your practice. Um, this is our storage. It looks very similar. We all have the drag and drop and the, the, the thing that makes us different from a Dropbox is that we do have, um, we do have the ability to add data. So file info goes on top of the, I think we're going to see it right now. So you can put in dates, who invented something, you can put in notes. So if you're passing files back and forth with your team, it's really useful or with your attorney. This basic vault comes along with the, the one, um, the ID or IP, and we encourage people to share their documents within 30 days. So we give it to them for free for 30 days so they seek, uh, and that, seek legal advice. And this is our time stamping. We actually are independent third party, so you can use this for proving when you thought of something, when you uploaded it, and we use a checksum to do that. So that is our software. Um, thank you for listening, and thank you for having me. And if there's any questions, let me know. So did you say the interface was we could we can brand it we can edit it to to fit our brand because uh, we have a we have a startup portal mm -hmm. at Wilmer Hale it's very similar to this so we'd love to use it but we don't want it to look like they're going to a completely different vendor. Yes. So with um, we just relaunched this at the end of March. This is our version three, and we have an iframe available or an API, and it's customizable. We're we're um, happy to talk to you about that because happy to do a gray label or a white label. I still haven't met a law firm that wants to completely white label anything, so um, but happy to do whatever to customize it. Also self-explanatory. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so next, we changed the order around a couple of times, so sorry. So next is Julia and Jules from Hire and Esquire. Welcome again, everybody, and thank you for coming. We are Hire and Esquire, and as everyone knows, the world is changing, and the legal business no longer the, the legal business model can no longer hide from an economy that demands scalability and just-in-time efficiencies everywhere. Immediate history tells law firms that those who do not evolve will die. And even top law firms are now trending towards scalability. With labor is the number one law firm cost, traditional staffing agencies have not made the path to scalability very smooth. We're going to show you how the process looks with a traditional staffing agency. Hello. Hi, one of our clients is being acquired. I need three M&A attorneys for diligence ASAP. Oh, I'll be right on that. By the way, how was the Knicks game last week? Isn't our box at Madison Square Garden amazing? <laughs> As always. Oh, shoot. Hey, Johnny, can you be there on Monday? Oh my God. Yeah, fax me your resume. Oh, it's five o'clock, gotta go home. Bye. <laughs> okay, all right, all right. That's no good. He doesn't have a fax machine. I don't know what to do with him. Uh, all right, okay. Okay, we got three. 
<laughs> know that much anymore. Um, okay. All right. All right. Okay, Julia. I have three fantastic candidates for you. I'm going to send you their resumes by email, um, and then you can review them, and then you can let me know who you want to interview, and then I'll call them and set up an interview with them. Uh, let me see here. The candidate one looks great. Two and three are no good. Uh, it's mon I believe two more attorneys by Monday. Okay. Okay. So you finally like these three candidates. I'm just going to now fax over their conflicts checks, um, send them spreadsheets so they can fax back so we can confirm that they're actually able to work on this case. And then we can get started, finally. <laughs> um, <laughs> whew, I'm so glad that's over. Um, I'm going to send you a paper invoice in the mail, and then 60 days later you can send us a paper check back. Does that sound really efficient? Yeah, um, and I'm sure she knows that we're charging her 20% extra for that financing, um, but she doesn't know how much the attorneys are getting paid anyway, so it's okay. Um, and by the way, I sent you an engraved iPad as a thank you for working with Old School Staffing Firm. Isn't that cool? We don't really know how it works, but we use it as a, as a doorstop in our office over here. Yep, those boxes are really something. <laughs> and my admin did love the iPad. She put it right next to her iPhone from Special Staffing. But she definitely liked the iPad better, and that's why she called you to set up this project. Uh, she's also looking forward to your holiday party later this year. Yeah, it's going to be good. Our technology accomplishes in minutes what it takes staffing agencies days to do. And we have full account management capabilities, so we can help you as much or as little as you want. So the choice is yours. You can be a part of, law, of law's past, or you can join us and be a part of the future of law. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. How many attorneys are part of the network? We're Where getting contract attorneys are part of the hired Esquire network. We're getting close to 3,000 nationally. We're growing like 15 to 20 percent a month um, as we get more traction. So it's, it's growing fast. In what markets? Uh, so we have a national market of independent contractors that are a little bit everywhere, all over the place. <laughs> New York is definitely our busiest market. Philadelphia is picking up, and San Francisco is actually very enthusiastic, and it looks like it's going to be exploding soon. But we are, we have the capacity to staff nationally. Do you screen them beforehand, or do you leave that to the employer? So to get into our network, you have to be vetted to an extent. You have to have a bar license in good standing and um, have no disciplinary history. Before we put anybody on site and on our payroll, we do additional screening and reference checks and interviews. Yes. Do, uh, <clears throat> do most of the contract attorneys work virtually, or do they actually go to the employer's office? To so with AM Law 200 firms and in-house legal departments, it's almost 100% on-site. We do have, uh, we have some attorneys doing a remote, fully hosted remote document review with an e-discovery company, and we do have a lot of <clears throat> local counsel work where obviously the person's working in their jurisdiction, but for AM Law 200 and, in, and Fortune 500 in-house, it's usually on-site. Can you describe the profile of these attorneys? Um, you say they're ex-AM Law 200, but 
Like, what are they doing now, typically, um, outside of uh, you know working at a traditional law firm? Sure. So we have a variety of people. We have some people that will do things like e-discovery, and we have some e-discovery clients. What we see larger law firms and in-house departments going for is people that are highly specialized. So we have a lot of people that I would say are between five to ten years experience from an AM Law 200 firm, and a lot of these attorneys voluntarily left their firm. They could have been partner tracked ten years ago, but they decided that the rewards weren't there anymore to be partner if they were going to kill themselves to be partner, or they don't have necessarily faith that their law firm will be there anymore. So we have some people that just prefer to work flexibly and want to take off on a tour of Southeast Asia for two months or are opera singers in their spare time and have a variety of other things that they do. We also have, a, particularly in New York, this huge community of what we call lawyerpreneurs. There are people who worked at AM Law 200 firms, they're from top law schools. They decided they wanted to do something more startup oriented. So they're working part time as a lawyer to pay their bills and their rent in Manhattan and they're working on a startup on the side. They're willing to go work you know, 100 hours a week on a case for an IPO or a big merger and they actually prefer to work that way. And then they'll take a couple weeks off and, and work on their side projects. Are, are the attorneys reviewed by the client? I mean, you know, do you get feedback from the... So right now we are working on some internal review and ranking systems. We had a lot of pushback from any law firms to give us any feedback whatsoever, specifically into the system. Currently, our CTO is a former DARPA, DARPA engineer and specializes in artificial intelligence. So we're working on, one, learning people's preferences and different metrics within the system, including how long somebody's been at a firm, how often they're called back, and different patterns in their work history to kind of teach the system who's going to be a good fit at a good firm. So, and, um, what's the, so what's the cost model do when, you're, when you sign up for hiring an Esquire as an attorney? Do you pay a fee or no. just the employer pays you guys? Yeah, so we never charge attorneys anything and it costs law firms nothing to sign up. So you can use our software platform for free. The only thing you pay is on the hours that an attorney bills. So, and we're completely transparent. The law firm or the in-house legal department sets the rate that they want to pay the attorney. And then we charge, um, for W-2 employees where they're on our payroll and insurances, we charge 35% on top of what you pay the attorney. And most um, staffing agencies are 50 to 100%. And if you go to a place like Axiom, which is more the level of attorneys we tend to have, we have a lot of people that are also Axiom attorneys on our system. Axiom tends to mark people up 100 to 200%. So we, um, we definitely are more, a lot more <laughs> cost efficient because we don't have the same infrastructure that an Axiom or a staffing agency does. There are no other questions, then we will go on to the last demo. Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Eric Dykema, and I'm the CEO and co founder of Case Rails. At Case Rails, we help attorneys at big law firms make perfect legal documents faster. Uh, just a few words about who we are. Um, we are lawyers who code. Uh, myself and Kyle co-founded Case Rails after a stint as associates at King & Spalding. Uh, but before that, we are both engineers from Carnegie Mellon and MIT. Uh, we know the law and we know the engineering and we're building this product to solve the problems that we faced as associates. We think right now there's a big opportunity in the marketplace for law firms who see the value of technology and efficiency. Uh, everyone knows that there's sort of a big disruption in the marketplace over the last few years. Clients, which kind of didn't happen very much before, are shifting their business around to find efficiency and shifting from lower efficiency to higher efficiency law firms. We think this is an opportunity that both big and small law firms can benefit from. Big law firms can take advantage of technology to get more efficient and take business from their competitors. And small law firms can use this technology to get more efficient and take business from big law firms. So it's kind of a healthy ecosystem of sharks and fish and all that stuff. <laughs> um, so what's the problem we're gonna solve or how are we gonna increase efficiency? So as Ned was discussing before, the trainers review a lot of documents. Uh, what we did and what we're tackling is writing documents. We think that's the other big thing that a lot of lawyers do. So how is that inefficient? Well, if you look at this sort of sample document, which is an administrative motion in California, over 80% of this document is boilerplate, or mandated by the case, or the court rules for pleadings, and so on. 
Um, but nonetheless, an attorney writes this whole thing out. There's no sort of point and click to get your pleading on California stationery. And this is just a factor of word, process, ugh, word processors themselves are an inefficient tool for attorneys to use. Um, <clears throat> In other practice or in a lot of practice areas, firms like to try and solve this problem with document automation. But we think there's two big problems with document automation in our space. One is that law firms and law firm associates don't want to program their own interviews. If you're an associate, you have 85 tasks to do and you're always a week behind. You're just going to bang out the thing and get it over with and move on to the next project. And firm IT staff can't really pick up for that like when there's a thousand people in the firm. And likewise, a simplistic sort of interview format, which is what most document automation has, just doesn't work for complex, high-value drafting tasks, which is what big law firms do. There's no number of questions you can answer that will drop out of motion. It just doesn't happen. Uh, the solution is, is case rails. Let me see if I can get this to work. So I'm also going to be brave and try and do the live demo. So. <laughs> okay, so... CaseRails is fundamentally a word processor that we've designed from the ground up specifically for drafting legal documents. It doesn't do anything else, but it does this very well. Um, at every stage of the process, every document is sort of combined with its own interview, you might think about it, in document automation uh, language. So this document is associated with this case and this matter, there's sort of meta stuff that goes in the beginning, who it's to, who it's from, and so on. And then separately, there's the body of the document. This happens to be uh, responses to a set of interrogatories. So we see here, if you're familiar with discovery documents, you've all seen this before, there's objections, 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 questions, and then are we going to respond or not? We'll see in a minute. Um, one thing that Case Rails does for the attorney uh, is we format the document for you onto whatever the sort of uh, template mandated by either the firm or the court, administrative proceedings, jurisdiction, or, or whatever. <clears throat> Attorneys no longer have to memorize that ND Cal pleadings are uh, 24 point spacing and line numbers and Hawaii's are different. It just does it for you. <coughs> Excuse me. So to make sense of all this, like to make sense of this document, Case Rails has to know about the case that it's in. And so along with each document, we track information about the case. And so this case is, has to do with, um, uh, I'm sorry, for this case, we've tracked the, uh, the docket information, the court, the parties, who's the plaintiff, and who are the plaintiff's counsel, and so on. And so from within Case Rails, it's very easy to, for example, draft a letter to counsel, and that letter will be set up, addressed to all the opposing counsel in the case. So this is something that you might do 25 or 30 or 100 times in the course of litigation, and every time somebody's copying and pasting in those addresses for the opposing counsel, and that burns a half an hour, and that inflates the bill a little bit. Um, the other thing that Case Rails does for us is we store for a case a clause vault, which is a set of clauses that could be used and reused in different documents in the case. So this is a great place to put, uh, for example, define terms. If you're going to define a term in one discovery document and then use it in an expert report and then use it in a uh, trial memo or wh wherever you're going to use it, you define it once in case rails and then you just use that term over and over and you have it ensured that it's the same everywhere. Um, so let's define a term here. I'll define a discovery request response clause, which is right here. So this one is not going to help. I don't like this question. That's about as helpful as most of my discovery responses were. So uh, now I'll go to a document. Here is uh, an incoming set of interrogatories. <coughs> you know, in this case, the, the defendant in the case asked us three questions. And so using case rails, I'll click this button, respond, and case rails will build up the responsive document template. So this is something I used to give to my paralegal for half an hour or an hour, depending on the paralegal, and get it back mostly right. Now it comes back, it's right all the time, and I use case rails 
word processor editing interface to input the objections and responses to the questions. So I'll just do a couple of them here, but I don't like the instructions because they're broad. And I, of course, everyone loves privilege, say that all the time. I'll apply those objections and it's done. And now these objections to the instructions are going to be the same uh, if we want them to be in every discovery response that we do in the case. So there won't be a discrepancy between my RFP objections, my ROG objections, and so on, even if we have different associates drafting those documents in different offices. Um, likewise, we'll get down here, we'll have interrogatory responses, object to the use of any and each, vague and ambiguous, mm -hmm. I think facts, it's usually ambiguous, <coughs> apply, and uh, here I'll use my custom objection, I'm not going to help you with this question, apply that, and then uh, we'll go here, And case rules has rendered this document, you know, the objections that I selected into the format. This is sort of ready for, well, if I had answered all the questions, I'd be ready for filing, but we're going a little faster here, so. And so that's it. That's kind of the product. It helps you and your associate get to a first draft of the document in a much, much faster time frame than doing it manually, copying and pasting. And there's much less opportunity for mistakes then what can you do with this? So right here, case rails is, you're looking at the PDF version of the document, or if you click this button, it'll drop out a Word version that you can download <coughs> and put into your document management system, SharePoint, um, desk site, you know, whatever you might use. Um, So we've got a lot of firms kind of interested in the technology, and these are some of the firms that have signed up for our beta and that we're talking to now. Uh, we'd love to add some more to the list if anybody's interested. Uh, our first set of documents and products and templates is aimed at litigation because we feel like that's sort of underserved by the existing slate of document automation tools, and it's kind of our, was our personal specialty. Uh, and that's it. You know, if you're interested, please talk to us afterwards or contact me or Kyle at founders at caserails.com. Uh, thank you very much. Any questions? Please. I like the added layer of like responding to incoming documents. I think I've never really seen that. But um, how are the incoming documents imported into the system? Is it like with Nets product, you just feed it to the PDF and it's automated or whatnot. But, yeah. How do you, do you have to for, like, format it and all that? There's an interface for your secretarial staff or your paralegal or whoever to input them into the system. And doing that lets case rails track um, which ROGs are outstanding, which you've responded to, and, and so on. Uh, but we'll also do it for you. So there's an email address you can send your documents to, and case rails will put them into the system for you. So we, we expect that a lot of times we'll get sort of the late Friday afternoon I need this in the system by tomorrow morning, and then we'll grind all night and do it, so you can just get rested up to do the work. So, any other questions? No? Well, thanks everybody, and thanks to uh, Julia and Jules for hosting the event. Uh, we're gonna have sort of a happy hour outside. It's and, fun uh, here, but we've got nice, refreshing It's warm, that's outside. right. <laughs> we had a good conversation, so. Thank you all for coming. We've got it under an hour even. Um, so uh, yeah, let's go out and, and chat and eat and drink. Thanks for coming, everybody.